And now um, it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Margaret Janet. Margaret first delved into the physiology of birth for her 1993 book, Childbirth Unmasked, which made the scientific case for minimizing avoidable stress in labor. For her master's degree, she looked at women's experience of birth, interviewing mothers, and comparing notes of home and hospital birth. Control, that's the key really, declared one home birth mother. Margaret edit edited Midwifery Matters, the magazine of the Association of Radical Midwives for nearly 20 years, moving on to devote more time and develop a kneeling chair for obstetric units. Her book, Dynamic Positions in Birth, provides a theoretical underpinning for the importance of freedom of movement in labor. And her next book, The Natural Science of Birth, will explore the biomechanics of uterine function. So without further ado, let me uh, make Margaret the presenter and hand over to Margaret. Right. So Margaret, you have the controls on your laptop and you can speak through your tablet. I see. Yes, good. Have you got my voice? Yes, we have. Answer Thank you. My voice. Good. We have. Okay. We do have your voice. That's wonderful. I'm so glad. Yes, I see you have now. Right, I can cut my first paragraph. You've just said it for me. But I would just like to say Mary Cronk, our beloved Mary Cronk, did me the utmost honour of forgetting that I wasn't a midwife once. So I'm not a midwife, but perhaps I could be an honour of midwives. Anyway, my research at Keele um, was based on the assumption that stress hormones might entrap. And I had to learn how the uterus worked in order to know physically how they did. And that was a 25 year journey, which has led me to a radically new model of uterine function that fits so very well with what mothers and midwives know about birth. The British Journal of Bobs and Gynae um, published a prey of my new model. You can Google Jowit, B Jog. 2018 to find it, but not just yet, please. You get a better version here. Gosh, I'm sorry about my nerves. Anyway, before looking at the dust of birth, we need to take a close look at physiology and biomechanics. Basically, I found that the textbooks have left out half the picture. They've left out most of the bio biomechanics of the uterus, and they practically ignore the baby. They call him a passenger. I believe that my new model explains how the baby and the uterus interact with each other during labor. That's the dance of the birth. I'll do these slides. Next one, hold that way. Slide 14. Right, so the uterus has got two opposites and even contradictory functions. First of all, the uterus is a sanctuary for, have I, can I move that dot there? No. Um, the uterus is a sanctuary for a growing human. It's an incubator, nurturing the embryo as it turns into a fetus, keeping it safely inside, fed, watered, waste disposed of, all via the center. And then towards the end of pregnancy, the uterus gradually transforms into an ejection seat, a really horrifying really, um, but it is the most powerful muscle in the body and it's capable of pushing out a four kilo baby into the world or by itself. Even paralyzed mothers can give birth. One slide, move. <laughs> right, um, the bio biomechanics. The wounds are balloon. My new model is easy to explain because there's an everyday object that is a near perfect analogy for the uterus. The properties of a party balloon depend entirely upon its shape, its strength, and the material it's made of. It's pear shaped. A hollow elastic bag which grows, is under pressure, has elastic memory, and reverts nearly to its original size when popped, fragile, 
yet strong. Tide shall up the surface. Hormone. Right, this is the bit the textbooks do tell you, so I won't spend too much time on this. During pregnancy, progesterone keeps the uterus quiet. Progesterone stops con strong contractions. In nearly all other placental mammals, high levels of progesterone are quite enough to stop the uterus from laboring. Estrogen encourages the uterus to grow to become about 20 times its original size. And after the uterus has stopped growing, the fetus carries on growing and the uterus stretches and stretches to contain it. Um, and please, you must remember this, there's a huge amount of stretch. I have it not change slide, please. The slides are being very slow. We are. It's coming along. Um, right, going into. I might start speaking before the slide comes. But perhaps you can see it. The uterus has to remodel itself from an incubator into an ejector seat. Part of this transformation is the result of changes in the biomechanical maze of the uterus. Raised estrogen increases the number of oxytocin receptors so that the same small amount of circulating oxytocin has more places where it can act at the uterus. That makes it livelier. Raised estrogen also increases the number of electrical gap junctions. Muscle cells com communicate using electrical signals just like nerves do. Connexin 43 links up the muscle cells of the uterus electrically so that they can act as a network and signals can pass from one muscle bundle to another muscle bundle, potentially all over the uterus. So it connects it all up to become an integrated whole. And you all know Prohandin, so I won't waste time on that now. Oh, in the cervix, you can read that bit. Next slide, it's slow. Um, yeah, I've, come on, slide 18. Oh no, I don't want to join the audio. I'm already in the eighteen. I'm sorry about that. Eighteen. Go to eighteen. Um I think Chris, I want you to do my slides for me. Okay, I will do down. that. I will do Thanks. that. It's being slow. Um right. So it should be slide eighteen now. Yeah, and it is. lovely. Stretch leads to contraction. Now, one of the physiology midwifery textbooks says that it doesn't, but it, it does, let me tell you. Um, I say more about how the uterus works. It isn't just hormones that initiate contractions, it's stretch. The uterus is made of smooth muscle, and stretching smooth muscle is the body's way of moving stuff around a process known as peristalsis. Hollow organs made of smooth muscle tend to contract as a whole. The four chambers of the heart contract as a whole, each one. You can't see my hand moving, sorry about that. Um, anyway, the uterus is made of smooth muscle, and yet it stretches and stretches and stretches as the baby gets bigger. So why doesn't stretch lead to contraction in pregnancy? Progesterone alone is not enough to stop contraction um, for humans. It doesn't pre prevent premature labor, or the doctors would, would use it all the time. Next slide, please. Now, the next one, I added a bit to my balloon, which I hope is going to come up soon. Right, we have a constrained balloon. We can skip back to the balloon analogy. But this time, we put the balloon into a stiffish net. This one had uh, some garlic in, I think, I can't remember. The net in this picture was about the right size to contain a balloon. I blew up the balloon inside the net, and the net stopped the balloon getting any larger. The net limited the stretch. 
the mammalian equivalent of a net is connected tissue, may column and elastin. You may already know that the cervix is 90% collagen and only 10% muscle. It's this collagen cervix that breaks down to ripen the cervix before labor. You all know about that. What I didn't know until about five years ago now is that all smooth muscle needs a scaffolding of connective tissue, mainly collagen and elastin, to keep its shape. Muscle alone is too sloppy a material. Collagen stiffens it. So the muscle of the uterus is constrained in a network of collagen and elastin. Not so much as the cervix, but 40%, a significant amount. And I think that this network serves exactly the same purpose in the uterus as it does at the cervix, constrain movement and to place limits on the ability of the uterus to be stretched. Next slide, please. So during pregnancy, stretch and estrogen leads to growth. Progesterone limits contraction. And also, this is the new bit, the collagen network also limits contraction. Next slide, please. It's a bit more fun than just words, I think. Because for humans, next slide, please. Well, it hasn't come up on mine. Perhaps it has on yours. Um, I'm going to wait. Oh, oh, right. Yes. Okay. Well, um, and another one. <laughs> um, okay. This is the rubber bulb. A rubber bulb makes a dent. I've skipped a bit. All right, just deep breathing. Um, and the next slide, please. I make it 21. No, I've missed, we might have missed the slide. That one, that's right, because for humans, that'll do, thanks, Chris. <laughs> for humans, progesterone by itself isn't enough to stop the contractions caused by stretch. Why? Because of gravity. You can see the gravity by the little arrows I've put. Um, our habit of upright walking puts immense strain on the uterus. In four-legged animals, the weight of the fetus is slung in a hammock suspended between the animal's four legs. The calf can't just drop out. It would have to defy gravity. You have to go uphill. But there's no premature delivery problem for the heifer. But in humans, the weight of the fetus is directly above the exit. The human uterus has to work much harder to defy gravity. Hence, there needs to be a much stronger collagen network. Is there? I don't know. That's something for the analytic physiologists, and it's difficult getting your hands on the uterus at term. But what I do know is that we do have a greater supply of an enzyme which breaks down collagen, collagenase, otherwise known as M. Physiologists have, who have analyzed this tissue from slithers taken to their find more collagen when it was an elective cesarean before labor. So that elective sections, the uterus hasn't started to break down that network. Next slide, please. Chris, next slide, please. The, right, the collagen, this slide is put in to show you the effect of a network of constraining material. If you imagine, yourself squeezing the rubber bulb on the picture, it goes in and back, back out again. OK, the uterus isn't exactly like the rubber bulb. It stretches evenly instead of making a dent. But the stretch doesn't travel very far, just enough to cause a contraction to fold the baby back into the fetal position. And of course, we, we could stretch those things from the outside, but the baby stretches it from inside. Right, next. We're going to have a recapitulation of going into labor. So we'll just remind ourselves of the hormones in the set of labor. First, an increase in oxytocin receptors so that oxytocin can act in more places. Secondly, a new net of junctions wiring up the uterus altogether. And now, to add to that picture, we have matrix metalloprotein, MMP, which starts to break down the network of collagen. So that, like the cervix, the use are more stretchy. And as it becomes more stretchy, it becomes more active. 
because stretch leads to contraction. This is what it feels like for me to give birth. What labor like feels like for me. Contractions change. Right. Sorry, I just added that bit. Now, we all know that after birth, the uterus gets smaller. It reverts to near its previous size. Discharge, men's, uh, discharge from the vagina after birth is different from menstrual blood because it contains the breakdown products of the uterus itself. It's a different color. All that I am proposing in this new model of mine is that the uterus starts this breakdown process before labor rather than after. And this leads to a difference in the material properties of the substance of the uterus, which is less rigid, more stretchy. And stretch initiates contractions. I haven't got time to go into quite how and how they get timed. That's you'll have to wait for an August. Next slide, please, Chris. Right. Uh, um, slide. Inflammation. Would be. I don't know which one it is. Labor is said to be an inflammatory event. And on this slide, well, I can't see it, but perhaps you can. There we are. Um, I've listed some of the biochemicals involved in, in inflammation. Prostaglandins, interleukin-8, MNP, white blood cells, they all cooperate to digest the collagen. Next slide, please. It's the mother taking back control of her body. Could we have the next slide, please? Perhaps it's there. I'll carry on talking. If you think about it, all the way through pregnancy, the mother has been protecting and nurturing a small human with half of its DNA alien to her. Scientists such as Sir Peter Medawar, who researched skin transplants for burns patients during World War II, discovered that the body rejects and breaks down alien tissue. During pregnancy, the fetus is hidden from the mother's immune system. Could it be that the mother goes into labor when she finally recognizes that she harbors a foreign body. This would make labor the natural bodily response to foreign tissue. Ejected. Sorry, I went too quickly. It's OK. People can go back and look at these slides later once they're up on YouTube. Um, yeah. OK, um, so what is the next one? You could. The next one is the two balloons again, isn't it? The next slide. Yep. That's right. Yes. So all I've done on this that one, I, as you see, I've chopped the knots on the balloon on the right. You couldn't do that to a real balloon because you could see the air would just come rushing straight out. That's basically what happens. Take away, um, take away the neck and take away the the knot, and labour becomes inevitable. Um, I think that my new model solves some of the mysteries of labor. Now, the next four slides, I think it's four, 27 to 32, it might be five, are from an animation that a friend of mine, Pete Bradley, made for, to illustrate the new model of labor. Um, I do wish we'd been clever enough to put the baby inside the balloon um, and to have shown his movements. We need more work. But then we will. You can access the you can access the domain uh, through my website, which is birthupright, all one word, dot co, dot uk. Now, Chris, can you slide through to the last balloon picture? Um, I'll read it out as you go. The uterus is essentially a balloon-shaped elastic bag. The stiff surface is not the balloon. Next slide. I can't remember, I haven't got a picture of them here. Oh, it is being very slow, isn't it? So you can all see it. Um, I've shown the picture. Look, the 
set work has a way in that one, and the balloon is contracting down in all ways. And if you imagine that baby, he's, he's got out that cervix, um, which is opening up. I've lost half an inch. I think I've gone on the other side. Um, I don't know. Um, right. I think that's the last in that section. I don't know why it's got 19 minutes on it, but. That's, but, um, that's our fault, I think. <laughs> that's okay. Anyway, next slide, please. I hope you get the picture. Anyway, you can watch all on my website. But as I said, we left out a vital piece of information the baby. It was just too complicated to manage time. And to be honest, it still is. I need help. But the baby is really the first mover in all this. Because what is most likely to cause this UV stretch? Baby, of course. We can see. We have seen in the beginning. Does the baby kickstart labour? Um, I can't find this. I found one textbook that named the baby in the uterus, and that's, I think, biology is just dated about 1960. What is stretch in the uterus? The baby has to be, surely. Right. Why does this matter? This matters for instance. The huge system is for they will happen properly. I think midwives will know what I'm talking about. Certainly, induced labors are very different from physiological labors. If you are going to have to manage labor, you could wait for signs of transformation first. Um, Margaret, can I interrupt a second? Uh, to yeah. me, I don't know about the rest. This, your sound is beginning to sound a bit different, as if you're sitting slightly differently with uh, uh, by your microphone. tablet. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, an earpiece fell out, which moved the microphone. Is that better? Yes, yes. it is much better. Be. Oh, brilliant. OK. Um, right. You know about induction, don't you? I'm going to say. Um, I'm repeating what's on the slide, but just expanding a bit. So you haven't really missed much. One midwife told me she could feel she was cutting back against her hand when she palpated. This was at a ARM meeting at, uh, six months ago or so. I was delighted. It was evidence that the stretch. Please, more reports of this. Anyone. We need, we need more evidence than I have got at the moment. I've only got textbook biochemical evidence. We need some clinical, experiential evidence from midwives and from mothers. One more interruption, Margaret. You've got about yes. 10, 10 or 11 slides to get to your question slide, and you've got a little, and you've got about seven or eight minutes if you want to allow time for Q&A. OK, I'll speed up. I'll speed up. <laughs> right. So why does this matter B. Right. Um, next slide, please. Humans are not the only mammals to have one baby at a time. Vets say that the first stage of labour is for positioning the foal. Um, and you can skip to the next one as well, which is a picture of for foals in the uterus. During pregnancy, the foal lies with its heaviest part, its spine, slung, slung in the hammock. Is the, belly, is the bear's mare's belly. For stud vets, the repositioning of the foal is one of the first signs of labour. Look at the pictures and look at the foal's back legs. The foal works with the mare's uterus to rotate 180 degrees so that it's born right side up. Our babies don't usually to, need to make such enormous changes in body position, but they do need to fit themselves snugly into our tight pelvis in order to get themselves around the sacral promontory and to get themselves into the very best position to make the cardinal movements we learn about in the textbooks. Next slide, please. The fetus is not a passenger. The human fetus works with his mother's uterus to position himself optimally for the tortuous journey through the bent human birth canal. Um, and he does this by using a combination of the stretch contract and his own neonatal reflex. Slide number. 37 now, please. The uterus is a balloon shaped trampoline, and this is how the bits of labor works. I know you've 
form for it. I'm sorry it's been so much science, but I think I think you needed it. It took me a long time to understand, and I hope I'm able telling you all right. Right. Um, we'll look at how the stretch contract reflex can move a baby. The technical term is mechanical transition, and I found only one textbook that even suggests that it might be the fetus that's doing the stretching, but that's okay. We all know that babies kick, even if the sign don't. The center of each contraction is where the baby makes a large movement, usually his feet, I think. It could be his back. Can you just go up, back up a slide, please, Chris? Sorry. Back to the trampoline. That's all right. Um, you look at the trampoline. There we are. That's right. Um, I think the baby's using his feet. Um, look at the trampoline. If you bounce in the middle, it'll push you straight back up and up again. If you if you bounce to one side in the as in the right hand picture. It throws you back into the middle because of the way the elastic works and where the tension is. And um, and if you look at the bottom one, I've put a plank. We've put a plank of wood underneath it, which is changing the centre of the contraction, and it's throwing throwing the person now out from the centre. Now this is what I think happens when the mother's lying on her back on the bed, her spine, her even the contraction belts, for heaven's sake. Would, Get in the way of maybe being able to stretch where it wants to. Right now we can have the next one. How does the baby do his stretching? Um, next slide. So do you want right. to go to third? That's no, that's fine. Thanks, Brooke. But this is here. This is this is the exciting bit. Sheila Kitzinger rang me up after my first book and told me about about this. Um, John McConferetti, um, the father of paediatric neurology, looked at the reflexes. He studied ultrasound um, of babies before birth and plotted a gestational timetable of the reflexes when they first appeared and when they faded. And he concluded that some reflexes were used by the fetus to find what he called the invitation of softness, the softening and stretching lower segment of the uterus and the top of the cervix. My midwife friend Joy Horner and I got together over coffee um, to think about what reflexes might help with what movements, and we came up with the following ideas, which I've put in it, um, in, in two slides. Um, we need more practical research. This is, this just represents our best guess. Can we have the next slide, please, Chris? So you've got to put a large question mark over the fourth column because this is joy and, and I guessing at what's happening. I'll just pick up one from each. Uh, the the Mara reflex. Um, and if you allow the, the baby's head to fall back an inch, the arms and legs first extend and then pull back towards the body. Well, is this a baby getting into the pelvic inlet and tucking its chin in? I don't know. Um, Next slide, please, Chris. And there's quite a lovely one on this. Um, and it comes up the right, the gallant reflex, stroking wide of the spine, trunk and the hips move towards the side of the stimulus. And we think that this might be the baby spine going passing, passing the sacral promontory and causing rotation into the mother's sacrum. Um, okay, next slide, please, Chris. Right, so I'm afraid that's about all the dance I can do. But the dance floor is the wall of the uterus. It needs to be primed with the right hormones and it needs to be stretchy enough to contract when kicked. As the stiff network breaks and contractions become ever more powerful as women and midwives know them to be. It's not just the question chucking on the otocin and causing the whole thing to implode. Sorry, I'm getting a bit political here. As for the dance movements, this is very much working. It's why I desperately need a biomechanics lab that can study smooth muscle preferably with a baby inside. I think if we found a mother having Braxton Hicks contractions, we'd 
be able to do quite a lot. And I also need someone with the right sort of brain to help map the fetal reflexes onto the cardinal movements. Um, I mean, I'm sort of inching, intuiting towards that way, but my brain isn't quite good enough. Um, so I want some, I'd love some of this once the lockdown is over. Meanwhile, let's give the fetus all the room he needs. Let's let the uterus hang free so that the fetus can stretch it where he needs to stretch it to get into the best position for second stage. And that means giving his mother freedom of movement off the bed, um, unless she really wants to be on the bed, I suppose. She might do, she might want to be on her side. Forward leaning works best for me, and it seems to work best for other mothers. Let's stop believing that the mother and baby can do nothing except accept their fate. We really don't need to advise mothers to lie back and think of England. We need to let mothers and babies follow their own instincts. We need them to reclaim their bodies and to do what comes naturally. And this is, I think, how birth works. And the next slide, please. Which is a picture of my kneeling chair, I think. Um, it's slide two. Um, you, might, you might see it up already. Oh, oh gosh. No, I've got a blank screen. On that blank screen, there's pictures of my kneeling chair. Um, it, it's, it goes into two positions. My son calls it the flipping chair. Um, because it, you, can, you, can, you can get a high, a high level and a low level. You can have a seat bit. You can stick it. You can even kneel on it and do a forward leaning inversion. If you want, um, it's to give. I, really, I designed it for obstetric units to help nudge mothers off the bed, and that's that's it. And have we got time for questions? Gosh, I've run over a bit. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, we've got time for a couple of questions. Um, I have one that I've noticed go through while you were talking. And Buki from Nigeria asked, "For how long do you wait for transformation at EGA of forty-one weeks?" I don't know. I I think I think that sometimes labour doesn't happen because the fetus has got in, into a position that he can't that he can't get out of, um, and that a bit of rebozo work, perhaps shifting the uterus about in a scarf. Imagine hands interlaced together underneath the uterus. Try all fours kneeling. I think. I think I think there's an awful lot we still have to learn about this, but I think that positioning might stop some baby, some labours happening. Um, that's all I can say. I think for the moment, in the time we've got. Um, okay. Oh, um, don't, right. don't 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 worry and don't overdo it. Um, okay. I've got time for one last question. If someone would like to ask Margaret a question, otherwise I'll move on to our closing slides. Right. Uh, I, I see someone said submit it to the Journal of Medical Hypothesis. It has been published, been published in the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynaecology in their debate section two years ago. And I have not, nobody had, I, I mean, I had to praise it like mad to get it into 500 words. Um, but you've had an awful lot more than that today from um, physiology. Didn't, didn't want it. Loads of people don't want it. I'm a nobody, a lay person. That's the trouble. So I want you all to start talking about it and think about it. And thank you for coming here now and listening. And well, gosh, thank you. Margaret, Margaret, thank you so much. You could see from, I mean, there weren't a huge amount of questions, but you could see from the conversations and comments going through that people found that really, really interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm a knob midwife, as we know from our conversations before, but um, uh, but I, I found it really fascinating just from the time I've spent with the IDM. So thank you very much.